Hi, I'm Josh Brown, and I'm here with Claire Flynn Levy uh, of Essentia, and you are an expert in investor behavior, and not just academically, but how to actually take the insights from how investors behave and make them part of a process so that people trade better, invest better. How, what's your background? How did you get started in doing that? Well, I was a portfolio manager for many years myself and uh, a tech specialist. Right. And I had a great run during the internet bubble, um, as all tech specialists probably did. And then once... That was hard not to make money. It was hard not to make money. If you were in technology money. stocks. Um, and yet, the way the industry is structured, I won all the awards, I got all the promotions. You know, I was very much being told that I was skilled at what I was doing, when actually, how much of that was skill? Right. Who's to say? Um when the bubble burst, it suddenly was much harder to make money. Yeah. And I was looking for feedback on what should I be doing differently that would get me a better result. Now, what's interesting is that, w so maybe your first instinct was, should I be doing more research or should I be, uh, and I think that would be a lot of people who are in the asset management business, they would say, well, my information should be better. Mm -hmm. But you actually discovered that it's something else. It's not what you know, it's how you're, uh, executing and and what you're physically doing with trading and with um, stock selection and timing. So could you get into that a little bit? Because yeah, that's yeah. something that we're fascinated with at at our firm. So it's great to hear that someone's taken a more rigorous approach um, out there to look at those issues. Yeah, I mean the the instinct, as you say, is to just work harder. Yeah. Learn more, get more information. Go to more conferences, talk to more CEOs. And yet right. the science would say that there is a decreasing marginal return that comes from each incremental piece of information past a certain point. You're wasting right. your time. Right. And I personally felt that. I felt myself wasting time and with you know 24 hours in a day you you really want to be maximizing your return on energy expended right. in the same way that you want to be picking stocks that are companies that maximize the return on capital employed okay you know, your capital is your energy your your emotional energy your psychological energy your physical energy so i want to be putting my energy chips on the the thing that i think has the highest probability of making me money and what i realized was that it wasn't doing more research. It was doing what an athlete would do and, and looking at a game tape for every single investment I've ever made and then honing in on what are the types of decisions that I make over and over again. Right. And picking a stock, that's only one decision right. that you make in the, in the life of an investment. You're, you have to decide about how much and when to buy when it, to buy, and how to fast sell. to get up to size. You know, You might add and trim along the way and then a set of decisions on the way out about when to sell, how fast to sell and so on. Um, am I doing all of those as well as I possibly could be? Right. You know, it's the same thing as an athlete saying, well, when I hit this kind of shot, am I good at that? Do, in what context am I good at that? Should I be practicing more of those more deliberately, you know, really focusing in on what I could be doing better about each so shot? The, so, yeah, so the athlete comparison that you've made, I think, is really interesting because some of the most successful teams, um, especially in the NBA, are now playing up the fact that they're using data, not only to select players, but to, to then decide how they're gonna use those players in the course of a game, or what they're gonna have each player work on um, behaviorally, mm -hmm. about how they train, about what they do when they have the ability to, to um, move the outcome of a game, being in a certain spot. Um, and obviously it's not the first time someone's made that comparison, but when you're talking about behavior, so you founded, uh, I guess the best way to put it would be a consultancy that's technology enabled mm -hmm. to do that, but not for athletes, but for people managing money, people making those buy sell decisions. Um, and, and how exactly does that work? How do you work with a client firm? Well, so we call it a behavioral analytics company. And, but as okay. you say, it is a hybrid of human and machine. So we've built this tech platform that takes all of a client's historical data, you know, all their trades, all their holdings, um, along with some, some metadata about, you know, what type of thing they were trading, what day of the week did it happen, you know, stuff that, that you can collect passively. Um, we put it all together in this, in this application, which then has been designed very specifically to look at investor skill around picking, entry timing, adding and trimming, and so on. We sort of Put, bring it all in there. And then a human, and in, in our case, all of our, our humans, we call them insight partners, right. are ex-portfolio managers. So a big part of what works about this is that 
when we sit down with a, a client, it's a peer conversation. It's, it's somebody who's sat in the seat before and who gets it and is not just trying to tell you how to do your job. Yeah, like I can give you data. I could say, it turns out you're really good at buying, but then you sell at the wrong time over and over and over again. And that's something that you need to work on. Mm -hmm. And here's the data. But if that's just coming from an email or it's not the same as let's guy. have a conversation about what's going on in this data. Yeah. And, and if it's coming from a quant, unfortunately, no matter how smart the quant is. A soulless, ice cold quant. <laughs> it, like they could be the, the right. warmest, friendliest quant in the whole world. They're not world. trained it, for this. It doesn't matter because the PM right. automatically says, you don't know what my life is like. You've never sat in my seat. How can you tell me? Right. Whereas we can say, look, we have sat in your seat. Yeah, your we people totally get say, it. oh yeah? Yeah. Huh. I and, went through this. And this isn't a criticism of you also. You know, we're not here, we're not compliance. We're not risk. We're not here to embarrass you right. or beat you up about anything. We are here as the coach that you hired yourself. If you're the athlete, we're not the, the you know, the management of the team that just bought you. You know, right. we're the coach you hired yourself so you would make that team or you would win the Olympic gold. Um, so we're only in it to help you. And right. that sort of sets a tone that's quite different to what would go on if say the risk management team of the firm tried to do something. Yeah, you're different. not coming in like, hey, it turns out we have a machine that makes better decisions than you do. Yeah. So today's uh, just a uh, kind of cursory thing, but long term you don't have it. You're saying the opposite. You're saying like the firm is invested in you already. Mm -hmm. emotionally, financially, we need you to be at your best. Here are the, the things that you're doing within the portfolio that need help. And, and the other thing is that people will say, well, I'm having trouble explaining to my investors exactly how I make money or exactly how skilled I am. You okay. know, obviously there are a lot, there's a lot of pressure on active managers these now, don't days. You, don't you agree that like, there are probably two, maybe there are more, but like, I'm just guessing, you've seen this in real life, so correct me. There are probably like two types of PMs, one type where they're like, yes, I want to get 10% better. Mm -hmm. What are these little things that I'm doing wrong that I can fix? Mm -hmm. But then there's probably like that old school, usually a guy, let's be honest. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, no, I got it. Don't, you know, yeah, yeah. I don't need all your fancy contraptions. Yeah. You know, don't put an EKG on me. I, could, I got, I mean, you probably run into both, right? I mean, look, they, Moneyball is case in point. They had that in sports too, I right? Love, the it was old, such a great, I mean, the book's good, but like the movie, like. Yeah. They had these old baseball guys and they're yeah. like, yeah, he looks like a hitter. <laughs> exactly. And right. that is, you know, there are certainly people in the fund management industry who still behave like that. They will age out of the system, yes. you know, soon enough. And I think the next generation is very data oriented. Yes. Um, and then you've got in the middle some people who are sort of in their 40s and 50s who are actually just curious people and interested intellectually. And maybe we call them skilled but humble, um, the type of people who are up for having a look because they know they're not perfect. Right. They're also confident enough in their in you know in their track now record what, to believe right, they so, are good. At so something. now, what do you say to someone who says that there's a certain je ne sais quoi to somebody who comes up with this huge idea and totally just trounces their peer group because they had this insight and it's not something that can be repeated and um, you know like everyone uses the example from the housing bubble. Um, where some, or imagine the tech bubble that you referenced earlier. Mm -hmm. The person who just knew it was time, not only they, they should bet against it, but the exact time. Mm -hmm. Like, how did, like, there's no way, uh, my guess, there's no quantitative way to pick up on A, who that person's gonna be, mm -hmm. B, whether or not that behavior is repeatable in another market environment. Like, mm -hmm. you would agree that there are probably limits mm -hmm. to what can be done by studying people's behavior or studying the trades they've made, right? Well, I would, I would say, you know, if you're an allocator, for example, and you're trying to find a manager who's going to do that or do <laughs> that more best, than one, Best of luck. Like, good luck. Right. But also focus on the process, you know. Right. So, so you can be very right about a particular call and your timing could be brilliant. And then you don't follow the process once you're making money and you blow it all, you know. Or you, you think that it's going to be you know, as easy the next time. So you, you don't do your process as you go into the next idea and then you blow it all. So, but even away from the, pro like, so, so one of the most famous, we're not going to name names, one of the most famous hedge fund managers that traded the financial crisis um, perfectly at the beginning, mm -hmm. picked up on everything that was going to happen, constructed the right trade, made like $30 billion. Mm -hmm. um, this person was a, a convertible ARB person. Like, 
it was so far outside their process mm -hmm. to be making bets on CDS that it's all, it's all, it would be almost be like if I'm a guitarist and then I go pitch the winning game in the World Series. Like, it, like one thing totally has nothing to do with the other. Mm -hmm. And I, th I, that, I guess that kind of outlier is not what you should be investing, expecting. Definitely and not. probably making smaller improvements and getting better is more rational, which is where you guys come in. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and getting people who know what their remit is, you know, they know that they are a, a converts manager. Yeah, and that's what I do. So I want to be the best. Yeah, okay. yeah, exactly. And then helping them understand that, you know, one year does not a career make. So therefore, you know, you can have a good year, you could have a bad year. Let's not get too excited about how much of that is down to you personally. Right. Let's focus on what did you do well? And what did you do poorly, regardless of what the outcome was, so that you can, you know, keep iterating and iterating. And over the long term, the luck part will even itself out. And the skill that you've honed will be what wins. The day. So I would argue like the the service that you're offering is more important than ever, given the realities of investor preference for low cost investor mm -hmm. disinterest in alpha. Mm -hmm. I guess is the best way to put it. Um, there's there's some data there's some data showing that even outperforming funds have been seeing net outflows mm -hmm. this year and last year, which seems kind of in, um, inexplicable given the history of investor flows. Um, so maybe like that ability to quantify the skill of the manager becomes the most important thing a firm can focus on in asset management. I agree. I mean, to, to me, I it's, it's the agree. most important thing. Uh, but it goes for, for people outside of asset management, too. It's like if you can figure out what is it that I'm trying to achieve and what are my resources, I have a certain number of hours in the day. I want to do more of what I'm good at and less of what I'm not. I love, yeah. You know, it's just common sense. So. Uh, in fund management, the, the pressure is on so massively to prove that you're worth the fees that you're charging. Yeah. And I think now at this point, there's a branding issue around active management where you're going to get fired often despite good performance because, you know, a large allocator has just decided enough already with the active management. So I personally, I believe that there is skill to fund management, that there are going to be active managers, just fewer of them. Um, and that if you want to be one of those, you got to play at a different level. And this is what makes you play now. At that so level. in so in real life, your like your business is catering to some of like very like I'm not going to name names, but like catering to some very large asset management firms, uh, alternatives, some big hedge funds. Um, do you find these people are probably the survivors because at least they're thinking about the right thing right now, like? Like, Definitely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think that it is if you're not thinking about this, then the clock is ticking against you. I agree. And I think that there's a generational thing happening, like the marketing and advertising does not work or even the reputation mm. does not work in the absence of there being some evidence that you actually can do what you say you're going to do. Yeah, I think the market's fed up. But then if you can um, create evidence that, that shows that you do do what you say you do, right. at the end of the day, humans still prefer dealing with humans. And so if you can meet a human fund manager who you actually trust and believe does add value, then you know it's an easy decision to give that person money. Totally agree. So I told you we were going to mention the conference that you're throwing, the event you're throwing early in the video, and here we are doing it at the end. Um, but it sounds really cool because it's in New York, mm -hmm. um, so that's good for me. Mm -hmm. But it's about a topic that I don't think anyone's done an investment event specifically around this topic. Yeah. Um, we came close with evidence-based investing, but this is like purely on the behavioral side of becoming a better investor. Mm -hmm. So I want I want you to talk about it, not me. Sure. Um, it's the second one you're doing, second annual. Yeah. Okay, so what can we expect that at the event? What's it called? Where is it? What date? Give, sure. give me everything. Yeah, it's called Behavioral Alpha. It's on the 9th of November in New York, um, in the Flatiron District. And it is an event for uh, senior fund management professionals, primarily PMs and, and chief investment officers. Right, um, this is for like institutional investors and PMs and like asset yeah, managers. people who make investment decisions. Because it's not like 
throwing the doors open. You're only going to have, what did you say? 70? 75, yeah. It's quite a small event. And, so and everyone will feel like they're involved in it just by being there. Exactly. It's not a huge event. Exactly. I mean, it. the purpose of it is really just to bring together those people that, you know, there's one in every firm who is the lone wolf who's been talking about this for years and has read all the behavioral finance books and has been looking at how to apply them and, and is struggling to get that sort of buy-in from colleagues we bring these people together right, and say, so look, you're not alone. So it's a one day event mm -hmm. in Flatiron District. And then um, you were telling me that it, the, the, the day ends with a poker tournament or poker instruction. Yeah. So one of our, Which during like the day, very cool. yeah, it, I mean, it's particularly because poker has become so topical amongst, you know, financial Everyone media. Everyone read the Annie Duke book. Exactly. That came out this exactly. summer. Okay. And I actually just uh, published an interview with her today as it happens. Uh, um, she's awesome. Her, one of her friends and, and peers is a woman called Maria Konnikova, who is a psychologist who great learned how to. tennis player. Uh, no, different one. Uh, just kidding. <laughs> Not the first time I've heard that, though. Okay. <laughs> I bet she's heard it a lot. Okay. Um, but she has. She basically learned how to play poker in the space of a year and got from zero to winning. I read about her. She like had to quit her day job because she yeah. was so good at poker. Yeah. So but. she's uh, one of our speakers. She's actually speaking about. Who else? Yeah, uh, give me the. Spe who else is speaking? So so we have Maria talking actually about con artists and what can what can investors learn from con artists. Okay. And then in the evening, she is hosting this poker event which is going to be uh, a bunch of people sat around a table learning certain certain poker concepts and seeing their own biases in action oh, and wow. then you know the take home is the ability to apply that to your your investment uh, decision making um, we also have the authors of a book called new power which is uh, more about behavior on mass so we this year we decided you know, the people that are interested in this topic of applying behavioral science to investment are interested in it from lots of different angles. One might be about why do I fall for, you know, irrational decisions. One might be why is it that uh, the sort of old school power is in the hands of a few people thing is crumbling and, you know, hashtag me too and hashtag whatever else are starting to become yes. a way that power Decentralization, is. Decentralization, mob mm -hmm. rule. Exactly. All, right. all the and things that we're, we should be terrified of, but get used to. Well, and which companies are going to benefit from that? Which companies are yeah. doing things all that right. really harness that? Who else? Then we've got a panel of um, CIOs uh, of different types of firm talking about how they're applying behavioral science in, in the context of their firms. Um, and then uh, Essentia, my company, is going to be presenting a white paper that we um, have been working on for quite a while that is all about how fund managers behave when they're on a winning streak versus a losing streak. Oh, that's cool. And it, right. it ties back to that sport analogy, hot hand, you know, does it exist, does it not exist? The, I've seen the, the data and I won't give it away, but it's fascinating. Now, okay, so now I'm invited. Mm -hmm, I assume. Of course. Okay, cool. <laughs> this sounds awesome. I, I'm, I'm totally into this. And if you read like Michael Batnick's blog and Barry Ritholtz and myself, these are things that we talk about like every week for years and years on end. So if you're a reader of ours and a fan of our stuff, you're going to love this event and uh, you should definitely stay up to date with what Essentia and, and Claire are up to. And thank you so much for coming in. And we will post links to all of the stuff discussed uh, in the show notes. Leave us your comments. Let us know what your thoughts are. And are you like on social media at all? Or are you? I am. We're at Essentia underscore AI. So that's not you, though. That's um, the... I personally am at Good C. Flynn Levy. All right. Um, do you want, yeah. I mean, do you want followers or? Of course. Followers who are interested in behavioral science and who are interested yes. in and uh, hard And hardcore uh, right-leaning hate groups. <laughs> Please, no. <laughs> Thanks for watching. We'll talk to you soon.